uh, is uh, uh, one of the few students of uh, Fred. Fred has actually very few graduate students. Probably because he was too scary. I can't include what's any. Uh, but uh, Lisa will talk about uh, one of the early topics, another topic that uh, Fred was very fond of, which is the uh, atomic hydrogen uh, <coughs> studies that he had uh, been doing. In the early days, I think he was working with Wall Sargent uh, on the, and then uh, when Lisa came along, picked up this topic, right? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, well, thanks for having me. I, I worked with Fred um, and finished my PhD at the University of Illinois in 1997, which was, of course, uh, immediately before Fred came here. So um, that, is, uh, that is the time scale um, under which I worked with Fred the most. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a science talk about Fred's work on dwarf galaxies. And I introduced the topic by just showing you a picture of a typical uh, object, a dwarf galaxy, that we are thinking about. Um, and the reason, well, for those of you who are uh, interested in numbers, um, let me just point out uh, that these are, these are really small galaxies, okay, so, uh, um, Half-light radius there is, is only one kiloparsec, and um, for comparison, right, the, the kinds of dynamical masses that we were talking about here are 10 to the 8 solar masses. Um, of course, that information came much later, as we'll see. Uh, so uh, my understanding, right, I had to go back and read through the CV to find out some of this stuff, but, um, and there are probably people in the audience who um, remember the history of this topic better than I do, so feel free to stop me if that happens to you. Um, but apparently, um, back in the late 70s, Fred and some other people either were sent or decided to go um, and take a bunch of photographic plates searching for um, additional members of the local group. And uh, so they found several uh, new candidate galaxies, members of the local group, of which uh, they were able to publish an IAU telegram, so that was all very exciting. That was how news got out, I guess, in those days. You had an IAU circular. Um, so there it is. Uh, uh, the other thing that they did uh, around, this, around this same time, uh, that they were engaged in uh, making single-dish surveys uh, for H1 emission, um, and I think that 79 paper um, came from data um, at the Ecclesburg Telescope. So this is one of the galaxies that uh, Fred and his co-authors discovered, and uh, as you can see, they're not much to look at. I mean, this is mean, slightly better on my screen, but with these really dinky really little galaxies, it's very hard to see. Um, and the big questions uh, that came out of these early papers fell into two categories. The first one of them related to the dynamical, you know, what are the dynamical masses of these galaxies? Um, and the second one was related to the interstellar media. When I say these galaxies had relatively little star formation, what I mean is that uh, if you go back and look at, uh, for example, the stellar masses of these galaxies and the H1 masses of these galaxies, in some instances you find that the H1 mass is several times larger than the stellar mass of these galaxies. And uh, that, of course, is very unusual for um, galaxies in general at a redshift of zero, um, which have the bulk of their baryons nowadays in the form of stars. So these little galaxies were unusual, uh, some of them anyway, in being extremely gas rich. And uh, Fred's insight at the time was that you should go out and get VLA H1 data to help with both the measurements of the dynamical masses and uh, the properties of the interstellar medium. So he went out, uh, got some data, in fact in 1982, uh, now, there was quite a gap between when the observations were done and when the data um, were published, but that we're all familiar with that process, so that's not a big deal. Um, but it's interesting, 1982, of course, was very shortly after um, the VLA began taking data 
for real. So that it was uh, at the time very early to be able to hit, um, you know, analogous to the Alma, you know, cycle one or cycle two or something. Um, now here's an example of um, the work that came out of those VLA observations. Is H1 um, is in contours superposed on just an optical image of one of these little galaxies. These are, uh, the, one of the items of particular interest was that these were the smallest uh, known galaxies at the time. And they were looking at, right, so what did they do? Well, dynamical mass, um, and uh, they did a, a bunch of work also on the properties of the interstellar medium. Now, this was an interesting paper. I went back and reread this paper. Um, and in fact, it's a remarkable paper for the breadth of topics that are discussed in this paper, including um, a little bit on particle physics and cosmology, all the way up through the properties of the interstellar medium and kind of the microphysics of what drives the star formation process. So there's really a, an amazing breadth of um, topics discussed in this 93 paper from Fred. <coughs> um, so I'll say a few words about the dynamical masses in dark matter and so on and so forth. So here is an example of one of these galaxies. Um, now, what I have done is actually I've taken figures out of a much more recent publication. It's a 2012 um, publication on this galaxy. But uh, a couple of the points of interest, in fact, when, when Fred did those early observations um, of dwarf galaxies um, in the, you know, this was mid-90s data, he actually had a, a great insight uh, which was that he needed to go for as high spectral resolution as he possibly could. Um, in fact, uh, that was a great insight, and that one of the reasons why these data um, that he was responsible for way back from 25 years ago or whatever, uh, the, the data that he took from the VLA are still being reused and reprocessed because they're still basically top of the line. VLA observations of H1 and dwarf galaxies. Um, so the, the one point on the right hand side, obviously I've got the velocity field. Um, now that they turned out to be very surprising. So these are basically the same um, results as this is as Fred. I've got new figures, but the results haven't changed. Um, and the first interesting thing about these dwarf galaxies is that there's really, if you go around looking for um, rotation, like you're gonna try to derive a rotation curve and measure a dynamical mass in the standard way that we're accustomed to for galaxies, um, you're gonna have a really difficult time getting a rotation curve out of that. I mean, in the first place, the velocity spread is really small. Um, and in the second place, it's not even, I don't know, it's not even just red on one side and blue on the other, really um, confusing. So they went through and they, uh, derived, a, a, basically uh, arrived at a technique of just using a virial mass um, calculation based on the H1 velocity dispersion for these little galaxies. And um, it's interesting to note while people are uh, in recent years starting to get the velocities of individual stars in these galaxies, so that they can calculate a stellar velocity dispersion and use the stellar velocity dispersion to get a dynamic mass. Um, not all of these galaxies have been done, and so for a bunch of these uh, itty bitty little dwarf galaxies, it turns out that the H1 based virial masses are still the best dynamical masses that we have available. Um, this was another, this is another example. This was that one that uh, Fred and, and co-workers discovered. Um, so I had actually two points about this. There was a really interesting discussion in, this, in, in uh, Fred's early paper about dwarf galaxies having to do with the nature of the dark matter particle. And at that time, um, I guess, as I said, there are many experts in the room who remember this better than I do. 
Um, but apparently at the time, people were still talking about whether neutrinos were a viable dark matter particle candidate. And this, um, once the dynamical mass calculations had been made, and it was established that these itty bitty dwarf galaxies do have significant amounts of dark matter, um, this one, so this one I think, uh, was the lowest mass galaxy with a dynamical mass calculation for some years. And um, the, there was a, a the insight that uh, Fred had, had in this paper is that the, um, if you understand that this galaxy has a dark matter halo, um, you can put interesting limits on the mass of the dark matter particle from the fact that this itty bitty galaxy is able to constrain the dark matter particles. So that's one uh, interesting aspect of this paper. There's a, another uh, aspect, so one of the themes that I am trying to show in this talk is that uh, while the work on dwarf galaxies is not something that Fred had been concentrating on in very recent years, um, it turns out that the work that he did laid important groundwork um, for the current research. So there are a lot of people uh, still doing research on these topics, which uh, Fred uh, introduced. And so the dynamical masses of galaxies, um, even dynamical masses based on H1 is still a topic that uh, some people are working on. Oh yeah, here's another interesting um, application. So I, as I say, I'm following, uh, trying to follow some of the leads that Fred developed in these early papers down to the current day. So here's one of the things that is currently happening with studies of the dynamical masses of dwarf galaxies. Um, I spent some time earlier showing you that uh, some of these itty bitty dwarf galaxies basically don't rotate. Uh, but the slightly more massive ones do rotate. And so for the, some of these slightly more massive galaxies, it is possible to uh, derive a rotation curve and infer a dark matter distribution. Um, and uh, so this particular set of authors have uh, inferred, uh, looked at the structure of the dark matter halo in some of these itty bitty dwarf galaxies to try to decide whether the dark matter halo has a cusp or a core. Um, and their particular argument, you can see all those data points up there, kind of cluster around the isothermal line. Um, so that was their, their particular uh, conclusion from this paper, though my understanding is also that the topic is not completely settled. Uh, people are still arguing about this, and some people prefer the NFW profiles, and other people prefer the isothermal. Um, so and if you're really motivated, you can look at some of those additional references. Um, but my point was, um, as I say again, these are the topics that were introduced in Fred's early papers um, are still interesting and people are still working on following them up. Uh, yeah, so maybe here's a, a, some other work that you can do, of course, with observations of local group galaxies. And, and what I've got here um, is basically the comparison of the H1 mass. I don't know. Oh yeah, okay. All right, so this ratio is H1 mass to the total dynamical mass uh, plotted versus the distance of the galaxy to either the center of our galaxy or to M31, whichever is closer. And the point here um, is that the galaxies that are very close to M31 or the Milky Way tend to be very gas poor, and the ones farther away tend to be gas rich. So here are these, so this, here's this little one, LGS3, that I have talked about. Fred and his co-authors had um, discovered. And uh, what we can hope to do then is to use these observations of the gas content of dwarf galaxies to learn something about the evolution of the local group in general. Uh, so here's a, another example that uh, Fred and I thought was interesting. Um, some of Fred's, the DLA data that 
here are some more modern simulations. Again, you know, following up the leads from what uh, Fred's early work on dwarf galaxies had done. You probably uh, remember that in this uh, the Lambda CDM model, the bottom up structure formation model, right? The idea is that there should be lots of little bitty uh, dark matter halos. And for uh, many years, it's been a confusing issue. Uh, the expected numbers of dwarf galaxies around M31 and Milky Way was much larger than the actual numbers of dwarf galaxies that you can see. Um, so here's a simulation which has attempted to address that problem. And here, so the top row and the bottom row are exactly the same, except that the bottom row is zoomed in a little more. And uh, <coughs> so the structure here, in case you can't read, so dark matter uh, is indicated over here on the right side, and the stars are here, and the gas is over here. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that, so all these little black circles over here represent dark matter halos of masses of 10 to 8 solar masses or above. So these are um, objects with the same dynamical mass as the dwarf galaxies that Fred had studied and uh, discovered. Uh, but the thing is that the objects that are circled in black um, actually have no stars. So they're dark matter halos, um, but they're dark. They're not dwarf galaxies. And the, the ones in purple are the actual dwarf, or the, there's still blue ones up here, as you can see. Um, so the ones in purple or blue are the actual uh, dwarf galaxies. Now, I feel a little bit um, uh, hesitant, actually, at showing this, because my impression of Fred was that he was very, uh, he didn't like simulations, basically. <laughs> you know? Had this idea that it was kind of a garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. Um, and, you know, you would only get out what you had put into the simulation. Um, so he's probably, you know, frowning at this moment. But I like the simulations, so I put it. So that's okay. Uh, the simulations uh, claim to be able to reproduce the properties of dwarf galaxies. And, uh, here, just uh, H1 mass, stellar mass. Uh, the blue <coughs> diamonds are actual observed local group galaxies, and all of the other dots are simulated galaxies, which they say are pretty close to uh, the observed H1 properties of dwarf galaxies. So that's kind of fun. Uh, all right, now a bit more on the detailed properties of the interstellar medium. Um, and I um, impose on you a little bit um, to illustrate where we're going, cartoon of the faces of the interstellar medium in the Milky Way. Um, what's going on here, okay, so temperature on this axis, log temperature and density here. Um, so the cold and dense molecular clouds are down here, and this is the um, x-ray image stuff up there, and in the middle is um, atomic hydrogen, which comes in, of course, a wide variety of temperatures and densities. Um, some of it uh, referred to as the warm neutral medium up here at temperatures uh, possibly approaching 10 to the 4 Kelvin, and the cold neutral medium down here. Now, the interesting part, the reason I bring this up is because if you're interested in the star formation process, if you are interested in where molecular gas comes from that you can build stars out of, okay, you're probably only interested in this part of the H1, right, the cold part down there because that's the stuff that's going to form molecular clouds. Um, and uh, it, in our galaxy, in the Milky Way, you can actually distinguish warm H1 from cold H1. There are a lot of ways to do it, but here's one example. Um, and this is uh, H1 emission and absorption spectra in basically the same region of the sky. Um, and the point here that I'm trying to show is that the cold H1 is the stuff that shows up in absorption. And it shows up in emission as well as a relatively narrow uh, profile with low velocity dispersion. And as we're getting into this, okay, this is one of the reasons why uh, Fred's insight to go for very high spectral resolution was a big deal. 
Um, and the warm H1 shows up as this broader component, um, which is not seen in emission, or not seen in absorption. Yes, sir. So this is one of the things that we did uh, in with Fred's uh, nice observations of dwarf galaxies. So we went, we looked very carefully at the H1 velocity dispersions uh, in dwarf galaxies, and we argued that we found evidence of the cold component, which shows up here as this narrow spike, um, and the warm component, which shows up as that broader component uh, in the H1 spectrum. And uh, so there's been a lot of this uh, work is going on to the present day. One thing that is, is particularly interesting, I think, is that people uh, do similar kind of work now uh, with C plus emission rather than just H1. So that's kind of fun. This was some of the legacy of uh, Fred's work on dwarf galaxies. Now, CO, of course, the other thing is, if you really want to know where the cold gas is that's going to form stars, you want to be looking for the molecular gas. And that, it turns out, is really hard in the dwarf galaxies because they have low metallicity. And carbon monoxide right, represents metals. So um, it has been very difficult. And Fred and I, in fact, um, made one of the zillions of attempts to detect molecular gas in low metallicity galaxies. We went to the 30 meter. Um, we said, we know where to look for this cold gas because it's going to be right where the cold H1 is. That's where the cold CO is also going to be. Uh, but not, you know, we, we looked and looked and looked with the 30 meter, basically, and did, didn't get anything. Um, it becomes apparent in retrospect um, that the reason we didn't get anything um, is because there is molecular gas in these blue bitty dwarf galaxies. Um, there's just not very much of it. Um, so this was a really exciting thing that happened uh, just a few years ago. Uh, it came out of ALMA, a detection of molecular clouds in these little bitty dwarf galaxies. This one's basically one-tenth solar metallicity. Um, and so it's this complicated picture. The H1 is in green, um, and H alpha is in red, and there's, there's some C plus in this blue blob right there. But the teeny little black dots are the molecular clouds um, in this galaxy. It's really fun. Um, finally, after decades of trying to be able to detect molecular gas in these teeny baby dwarf galaxies, uh, they, they are really small. Uh, what's going on in this, so this is a plot, the velocity dispersion of the CO cloud and the linear size over here. So you can see they're only like a couple of parsecs in diameter. No wonder they were so hard to see, right? I mean, the beam filling factor was killing us. Um, so uh, so this, is, this has been great stuff. Um, but Low, well, yeah. So the reason that uh, the reason that the CO clouds are so small, of course, is reasonably well understood at this point. Um, and what I've got here is a cartoon uh, showing the structure of a uh, region of the interstellar medium. Basically, ionized gas is over here on the left side, um, and the interior of a molecular cloud is over here on the right side. And um, so. As we make our way into the cloud, we can see, for example, the hydrogen transitions first into atomic hydrogen and then into molecular hydrogen, the H2 up there. Um, and the carbon transitions from C plus into neutral carbon and then into carbon monoxide. And the issue, of course, is if you're talking about low metallicity galaxies, then this transition from C plus to C to CO just goes that way into the interior of the cloud if there are fewer metals to work with. But it leaves open the possibility that a significant amount of interstellar medium uh, might be, as molecular gas, might be in this space where, so it's molecular hydrogen, but C plus rather than CO. Uh, and so that had also led us, uh, Fred and I, uh, I remember when ISO uh, was just coming out, Fred was very excited. We thought we were going to be able to detect C plus in the dwarf galaxies with ISO. Um, 
fortunately, after running the calculations, it became apparent that ISO just didn't have the sensitivity um, for the little bitty dwarf galaxies. Um, but uh, fortunately, Herschel has had the sensitivity, and we've now done it. So that was a great thing as well, also, that you have an idea that uh, Fred had had, which has propagated down to present day um, current activity. So I put up this picture again. This was the, uh, from the old H1 paper on uh, this little bitty dwarf galaxy. It's got basically three lumps of um, atomic hydrogen. Um, yeah, so we were able finally to do that uh, with Herschel, not to map the C plus emission over the entire galaxy. I mean, it was still it was hard, um, but we got one uh, field of view in the interior of the galaxy showing a little blob of C plus emission right there in the middle. Um, this figure is a, is a more complicated figure, which allows us to compare the distribution of the C plus emission to basically everything else. H one's here. Um, far UV and the H alpha and the 24 minus there. Um, this guy, Phil Segan, actually is um, he's my PhD student, so he's Fred's grand student. Um, Fred now has four, uh, four grand students. Um, uh, and the, the C plus emission, well, so as I said, this was an idea, one of those things that Fred had talked about was really excited about doing. Um, I bring up the uh, issue about the high redshift galaxies just because, of course, uh, this is one of the things that Alma is doing a lot of work on uh, nowadays as well. When the C plus line is redshifted down into the Alma bands, um, there's a lot of activity um, on the high redshift galaxies um, with the C plus emission, which uh, sometimes is very bright in high redshift galaxies, sometimes it's not so bright. Um, and I think maybe it's not always understood um, why the C plus emission is bright or not bright in the high redshift galaxies. Um, and I don't claim, again, to have this issue completely worked out. Um, and merely pointing out that some people have suggested that metallicity is an issue. Um, and the dwarf galaxies do provide uh, possibly interesting comparisons uh, with respect to the high redshift galaxies in terms of the metallicity issue. So, um, yeah, so this is all that I had intended to say. So Red did some early work on uh, dwarf galaxies, particularly H1 and dwarf galaxies, and uh, the intellectual descendants, if you will, of those ideas um, are still very active. People are still doing interesting research on a lot of those topics that Fred initiated. So, thank you. So, uh, uh, do you think, uh, had he not come to IAA, was this uh, in 97? Was that the direction he was pushing? Well, no. I mean, he seems very fond of the field guy and majors, right? You can see the that. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it is interesting, um, you know, to hear about all of these other projects that uh, Fred has been working on. It's almost like, are we talking about the same person? Um, I think we are. Questions? Lisa, uh, there's a part of the interstellar medium in normal galaxies that was not covered in your talk, and that is cosmic rays and magnetic fields. Yes. We don't know where magnetic fields of galaxies, how it actually arises. Some people think it must be due to dynamo action, which has differential rotation as an important part of the thing. So do these galaxies show any non not the radiation, synchrotron emission? Yes, so that, that is an interesting point. Uh, and that is one thing, uh, you know, while the, the VLA spectral line sensitivity has not increased a lot in recent years, its continuum sensitivity has. Um, and so there is current work on um, looking at synchrotron radiation, diffuse synchrotron radiation, 
uh, from the dwarf galaxies and looking for polarization signatures. Um, yeah, so that, I'm sorry? Did they find anything? Um, little bits. Uh, it's, it's still pretty hard, um, mm -hmm. but I think there is still uh, little bits of diffuse synchrotron emission. Um, yeah, well, and I think at that point, people say turbulent dynamo. Um, and that's uh, kind of the extent of what I know about the subject. <laughs> well, turbulence is an important ingredient, but if you don't have rotation, I think it would be difficult to get an organized magnetic field. Okay, thank you, Lisa.